Hello, I'm Steve Barron, and today we discuss direct democracy with Mr. Winston Peters, leader of the New Zealand First Party. There are four parts to direct democracy as practiced in Switzerland. The constitutional referendum, the veto referendum, the citizens initiated referendum, and the recall referendum. New Zealand only uses one aspect of this, the citizens initiated referendum, and even then it isn't binding on the government. While New Zealand doesn't have a codified constitution to require constitutional referendums, as the leader of New Zealand First and a former cabinet minister, do you see a need for the veto referendum and the recall referendum in New Zealand, and why do you think referendums should be binding on the government? Well, first of all, we believe that uh, the constitutional referendum could be used, uh, along with the citizens initiated referendum and the government initiated referendum, which is not one of the options being offered in that question. And the reason for that is a wise government looking downstream would say we've got these issues that the public are better able to decide, particularly on social issues, than the, the uh, temporary elected members of parliament are able to decide. And I'd rather trust the conscience of a country rather than the conscience of MPs, some of whom will be here for five minutes. Uh, so those three different options we believe in. The fact is that a better democracy is one that is expanded and where people have not a chance to be engaged for one or two seconds every three years, but at least once a year, and that can be organised at no great cost. We have a referendum every three years when we elect members of parliament to represent us. Why do we need referendums, and why not simply let the professionals do their jobs? Because an election is not really a referendum in the context that you're putting this issue. Uh, an election is about a multiplicity of issues on which people vote for multiple reasons, many of which will not have even a consensus of 50% plus. We're talking about a referendum where the specific question, with clarity, with a proper debate, with a uh, question that is capable of certainty, is put to the people. Now that is what you might call a substantive democratic process on which there can be no misinterpretation in a general election vote, that is not the case. The government will say, well, we have a majority in Parliament that supports, and, and, and that means a majority in Parliament means a majority of the public, support this issue. Well, that's hogwash. Often the election comes down to who the public think are best able to manage the economy. They may not like their defence, their social and other programs, education program, but they will vote on that issue. So the statement that they're identical referendum and an election is not true. It's often said that voters are not competent enough to make good decisions in a referendum and that they do not have the in-depth information that members of parliament have at their disposal. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that is an excuse for anti-democratic behaviour. The fact is that the public have as much capacity on issues of substance if the question is directly put to decide that issue they have as much experience, in fact, far more experience uh, and, than members of parliament, and a lesser likelihood of having their decision-making processes contaminated as parliamentarians have by all sorts of outside extraneous influences, such as, well, if you don't vote for that, you won't be in cabinet. And not very democratic behaviour that is, and whereas the public cannot be brought that way. Opponents often argue that referendums would be a tyranny of the majority harming minority rights and reducing civil rights. How would you answer this concern? Um, the Swiss experience shows that to be a, a fallacy as a statement. They have in Switzerland, for example, voted down certain projects and put in substitute other projects like greater expansion of educational spending, greater expansion of health spending. So a public that is experienced in this process can act extraordinarily uh, uh, responsibly, and it comes down to this actually, if you don't trust the people, who do you trust? Unlike the parliamentary process, referendums do not allow for compromise. They are blunt yes or no instruments, even though they are on specific issues. How would you respond to this? Well, my response to that is the last 30 years of government in New Zealand. And as our permanent slide down the economic and social uh, performance ladder of the world goes on, uh, you will nevertheless have members of parliament who will have made that statement to you and my response is well is that, how, is that the way 
states worked in practice. There's no doubt that if we had a news referendum properly, then the widespread asset sales from this country and the massive foreign ownership that's taken over in this country and the change in the share market from 19% foreign owned to now 72% foreign owned would not have happened. The people who make up the argument that you just uh, uh, repeated, not you personally, are anti-democracy. Referendums can slow the political process and disrupt the government's overall strategy. Wouldn't that be bad for society? Well, again, the last 30 years is a great example of what I'm saying. To have had the capacity in the uh, period 84 to uh, 996 to slow the process would have been very, very beneficial for our economy. And we would not be in the state we are now had the process been slowed down. Now, the fortuitous thing is that with the arrival of MMP, there has been a slowing down of what uh, used to be described by Sir Jeffrey Palmer as the fastest lawmakers in the West. Well, we've slowed that down, but there are still defects that we, uh, we uh, in slowing the process down, could find ourselves with far better law. That's why other countries have an upper house, and the capacity to slow the process down by up to two years. It's a check and, uh, and, and a balanced process which is seriously needed. And if an idea is good enough, it will still be good enough after two years. It's a common belief that the public are irresponsible and will only support referendums that promise short-term benefits without considering the long-term costs. How do you see this? Well, that's again, as usually the excuse of being all self-serving, egregious politicians who want to have their way, even though it can be an enormous damage to the country. Bear in mind this, that the wider use of referenda would, I think, take us to a four-year term, which the public would vote for, and give governments greater ability to govern, if they had that more, that better checks and balanced process, which referenda can be. So, you know, there are serious benefits here. But to the, for the idea that the public are bloody minded and not to be trusted, well, then why do we hold elections? People have a fear that special interest groups, wealthy individuals and the media will always decide the outcome of referendums. Are these fears warranted? Yes, they are warranted, and that's why the referendum process should have spending caps and uh, disclosure of interest caps around the various people who are lobbying and, uh, and organising financing of the either side of the campaign. Yes, they are warranted. However, you'll recall that the biggest referendum we had was in 1993 when the people of this country voted down first past the post and supported MMP. Now, the MMP side uh, were really uh, very badly funded or very lowly funded, and the first past the post side well, it's hugely funded by, in one case, international interests, like Telecom, which was in, as you know, a foreign-owned company. Now, that very process itself would have been an abomination any self-serving or, or, or self-deserving uh, democracy. The very idea to have external influences involved in a referendum is an outrage. So, yes, it's a concern. But it didn't work for the money side in that great debate that led to MMP. Some suggest that money will always buy a referendum. Is that the case? Uh, that's a genuine fear. And that's why there should be spending caps on both sides of the argument for referendum. That is, there should be a limitation. Otherwise, in the end, money can drown out the argument with the most obscene advertising campaign. And then alongside that, the process of what you call push polling so beloved of the United States, which leads them to very first dishonest, defamatory uh, a, a climate and the results are simply outrageous. And I've seen some of them in the United States and it's not something that we should be seeking to repeat in New Zealand. A referendum is estimated to cost between 10 and 20 million dollars in New Zealand. Aren't referendums really too expensive and how can you justify this cost when it could be spent on more hospital operations, for example? Well, first of all, uh, once every three years, it would be in tandem with the general election, so there would be no additional cost at all, virtually nil. The other two years, if referenda did get up on the uh, 1st of March, that is with the 10% threshold covered, and then you would have the long debate into the 1st of November, or thereabouts the Saturday of that new that date for the referendum, yes, there would be a cost but it would be less than half the cost of the Nova Pay botcher. And 
what price do you put on democracy? There has justifiably been plenty of negative publicity in New Zealand, which has highlighted the poor wording of referendums, with some referendum questions being misleading and ambiguous. How would you overcome this problem? By using plain, common sense English that is unambiguous, that is understandable. And the current referenda running right now on the asset sales is very direct and simply put. It, it cannot be misunderstood. Are you for the sale of these SOEs or aren't you? Yes or no? That's pretty direct. But I do admit that there, that there may have been times where the quality of the question, given the range of public servants and academia who were involved, led a lot to be desired. So how do we stop that happening again? Well, then I think perhaps you could um, the focus on people deciding upon the question of whoever a sound grasp of practical English. And I don't think that's beyond some of the Bachelor of Arts degree. Even though general elections do not have minimum thresholds or turnout requirements, some people feel that referendums should. What are your thoughts on that? Well, if they can live with no such requirements for a general election, why are they prepared, why are they not prepared to live, uh, to live with the same parameters for a referendum? And so I don't have a response to them other than they are demonstrating a significant element of hypocrisy. In Switzerland, they only require either 50,000 or 100,000 signatures to trigger a referendum, whereas in New Zealand, it's 10% of those registered on the electoral roll, which is over 300,000 signatures. In your opinion, is this a reasonable amount? And if not, what amount would you consider reasonable? The New Zealand amount is not reasonable, and it was decided at that threshold of 10% by the anti-referendum people in the National Party at the time this policy was drafted. That is, we proposed, the pro-referendum people, there were only a handful of us, but we did get our way to get it into the manifesto and it became reality. We proposed 5% uh, and in a significant caucus argument, the uh, Neanderthals won the argument. That's why it's 10. Uh, and sadly, 10 is an enormous number to get and an expensive number to get, and uh, I think it's just too difficult, and unreasonably so. The 1986 New Zealand Royal Commission on the Electoral System didn't recommend referendums. In fact, they went as far to say that initiatives and referenda are blunt and crude devices which need to be used with care and circumspection. What are your thoughts on this? I think most of the work of that commission was extraordinarily uh, good and of a very, very high standard. But I do not think that recommendation or that comment by them fits that description of being of high standard. I think they are plainly wrong, and I do not think that the people who were on that commission thought in uh, the, uh, how should I put it, a more internationalist way and looked and looked at the referenda process offshore, nor did they see it in our future. With the new technology that was coming, it wasn't quite here then, back in 86 that you could, with online process and what have you, ha have very successful, simple referenda questions put to the public at a minimal uh, of inconvenience and cost. Now, I don't think they understood that, and so I don't agree with them.